Yeah, welcome back. So I want to uh, tell you more about our study on uh, these uh, different backend as a services and uh, backends as a service and the apps that uh, we're using them. So what you see here is um, how this interface basically works, right? So you have an Android app um, that uh, basically consists of the app code itself, but that uh, has embedded into it um, the uh, backend as a service SDK. Um, so in Java, you would just link to this, uh, you know, through a Java file. Uh, the way it's actually done in Android is that when you link to a Java file, that is actually statically embedded into the app. So it's basically all combined into a single APK file. And so you have one app installation that actually comprises a copy of this SDK. And through this SDK, the app can then communicate with the cloud. And um, you know, all of these vendors, they have a lot of these SDKs for different platforms and programming languages. So you cannot only access these cloud services through Android, you can also do it through iOS and, and all different kinds of server-side languages. Um, you know, so you can also have the possibility to access the same services through a website or you know, web application, for instance, right? It's not restricted to just Android apps, but here we focused on analyzing Android apps. And then what do these um, services offer? Um, probably the most popular offering for Android apps at least is data storage, um, but then you can also have uh, social network integration for, uh, for instance, also for single sign-on or similar services. Some user administration, so you can really um, create user accounts and then, for instance, you can have separate storage for each user. Um, you can have push notification services for these different users and so on. And uh, by now there are probably uh, many more such offerings. And um, yeah, so in general, um, this is uh, uh, really uh, very simple. So you set up a database connection with your um, uh, through your SDK, right? So you're basically um, defining such an Amazon uh, S3 client here, for instance, and then you're providing it some basic uh, credentials. So they're actually in, with Amazon. Back at the time already, there were different ways uh, to authenticate with such a service, but the most simple one you see here, so you would actually provide um, a single key. Uh, well, first of all, an, an ID and then a key to log on with, right? And um, so this is actually what made these APIs so popular um, also already at the time, that this is just you know a single line of code and you have set up everything and then you can just work with it, right? But obviously from a security point of view, this is a nightmare, right? So you should never have a secret key as part of your program code, right? And even if this was stored, in some apps configuration file and dynamically loaded and inserted here, it would not be a good idea. So a secret key should always be derived from some user secrets such as a password. And here it's clearly not, right? And so, like I said, there are some more complex APIs that allow you to do this properly with user derived information. Um, but unfortunately, these insecure APIs existed as well. And some of them still exist today. And of course, uh, you know, if programmers are, are lazy or maybe don't have the time or don't know it any better, they would choose uh, the insecure API first. So um, there are basically these keys here, right? And um, so there is documentation that says when you access AWS programmatically, you use an access key to verify your identity and the identity of your applications. An access key consists of an access key ID and a secret key access. Anyone who has uh, your access key has the same level of access to your AW resources that you do. So um, there's a bit of a warning, probably not very explicit. They should actually really say, don't use this API. It almost never makes sense, right? Um, but uh, yeah, that's uh, what they had back then. So we thought, well, that looks really interesting, right? So uh, let's try to take a look at that. Um, also, it says that the AWS SDKs use your access keys uh, to sign requests for you so that you don't have to handle the signing process. You can even uh, create signatures with this. And it also said secret access keys are, as the name implies, secrets like your password, right? Um, and um, yeah, so it's, it's really interesting data. 
um, that we then sought to extract. And um, yeah, if you really have some um, IT security 101, right? So um, you have Peter trying to identify with some server um, and you then have um, some authentication um, that authenticates this user using a password, right? And then you have authorization that is actually telling um, this user whether or not um, uh, this user should be allowed to access certain resources. So this is typically the, the model that you go through, right? So you first identify a user, then you authenticate that user, and then you authorize that user. Um, then in the app authentication model that they have here, it, it's really sort of broken, right? Because they're basically saying, hey, I'm this app, and uh, I have this secret key, right? And it's in the app, so you're not really even authenticating any user at all you're authenticating maybe the app but even that is not pretty authentic because anybody who can uh, look at the bytecode uh, and that's really anybody uh, can really also extract that uh, that secret key right so this whole authentic authentication mechanism uh, it's already pretty broken and i talked about uh, amazon web services but the same was really true for parse and also for all the other services uh, that i mentioned and so the problem is now that if you have different users, right? So some of these apps that we looked at, they have thousands and thousands of users. But here, let's only assume there are two of them, like Peter and Howard. Um, then, you know, if there's only an app-based authentication and authorization, uh, then the server cannot possibly distinguish who is actually accessing here, right? So, um, I mean, there might be a user ID um, that is forwarded to the server so that the server only forwards to the app the data that is actually for Peter or for Howard, but there's no security, right? So if we can easily extract and force these, uh, forge these credentials, um, then uh, basically we can trick the server into returning to us anything at all. And so of course we were interested in finding out how are developers coping, right? So. Um, the thing is that the app secret key should be kept private, right? Um, but then on, on Stack Overflow, we saw discussions such as this, right? So, um, but when releasing the app, um, they can be reversed by some guys. So this guy or this developer was asking, I want to know uh, what is the best thing to encrypt or obfuscate or whatever to make this secure, right? So apparently there were developers who already saw that this is not okay, right? To just put a secret key into your app. So um, they al were already knowledgeable uh, in that regard. And then they thought of obfuscation, right? And we just saw earlier what obfuscation looks like when I talked about Harvester. So for instance, they would use AES encryption or, or thing, uh, similar means. Um, but we have already seen that using Harvester we can just uh, extract even such encrypted data dynamically without any problem, right? So it, it only takes seconds and it works pretty reliably. Uh, so basically the point is don't do this, right? So this is really not working. And um, yeah, so here were then some responses that we saw, right? So you can, you know, put your secrets in JNI code, wouldn't really work. Um, so JNI is basically a native code in your Java app in your Android app, but uh, even with Harvester, we would be able to extract that um, because in the end, you know, this code uh, or the, the secret is still loaded um, by the app itself. Um, the same if you use an obfuscator that will probably use uh, something like um, garbling, right? So not even AES encryption. Um, so that can also be extracted by Harvester. And no matter what you use, right? Even if you encode it as part of an image, um, at some point it's being decoded and if Harvester um, then instruments this decryption routine, we can read off the secret at this point. So none of this will really work if you have dynamic analysis that actually works. So uh, this is not a good idea. Never put secret credentials statically into an app, no matter what. Don't just obfuscate it. It's not going to help. And so yeah, we, came, we became aware of all of this, right? Um, by looking at some apps uh, manually back then, um, but also by looking at Stack Overflow and at how people do it. And uh, so we saw that this was all pretty broken. And so we said, okay, let's just go for it, right? Let's use Harvester 
let's do a large scale analysis of apps that actually use these services. And so what we first did was the following, uh, in order to set this all up, um, we actually did some manual pre-analysis. So we, we took some number of apps and we actually also um, took uh, a tool that we had developed um, ourselves back then uh, called Code Inspect. So Code Inspect is basically uh, a reverse engineering um, IDE that is uh, based on the Eclipse IDE. And using Code Inspect, you can really just load an, an app into Code Inspect itself. Um, but the app can be in binary form, so it could be an app that we directly extracted out of the Google Play Store, for instance. You can load that into Code Inspect, and it's automatically reverse engineered into Jimple code. It's actually a bit more readable variant of Jimple. And then in Code Inspect, we were able to then not just read the app's code, but we could even interact with it. And using Code Inspect, you can even dynamically execute the app actually in an emulator or even on a phone. Um, and then you can uh, inspect using a debugger, hence the name, what the app is actually doing at runtime. And you can even then uh, patch out certain statements of the app and, and interact with it. So by now, Code Inspect is actually a product. You can uh, buy it off uh, Fraunhofer SIT, where I used to work. Um, so if you are interested, I encourage you to take a look uh, and, and try out the demo version. Um, but using Code Inspect, um, we were actually able to identify such code here, right? So we would see that, um, for instance, in Parse, you have this initialization API, and then uh, there were certain uh, strings that were being used here, okay? Um, so we were able to see what are the interesting points of instrumentation um, and what are the parameters that we need to extract. And so um, then, for instance, um, this would tell us um, what the interesting API calls are and the interesting artifacts. So for instance, like users, tables, and so on, that we would be able to access through these different APIs. And so here we saw basically through a manual inspection, uh, manual interaction with the app, that we were able to extract such data, such as a user's table, from actual cloud services, right? So this is fetching data, not from the app, but from the cloud service, just by means of using the app, okay? And um, the results of the pre-analysis basically were that we were able to access all the records from these apps. Only few developers actually did use obfuscation at all, um, but even then it was only simple forms of obfuscation and like I said already, in general, obfuscation doesn't really help. So then we said, okay, using this manual analysis, we already found some pretty promising results. So we said, okay, let's get our fingers dirty. It's now really time for a mass analysis. And um, this we set up as follows. Um, so first of all, um, we wanted to analyze many different apps, many different APKs. Um, and then um, we did this uh, pre-analysis here. So um, first of all, we did needed to do some library detection. This is because, like I said, in um, Android, the jar files of these libraries, they are integrated into the APK. And in some cases, when people use obfuscators, they actually do some name mangling. So that means um, classes that are part of the parse API, for instance, they may not be called parse anymore. They might have some generic name such as a.b.c, um, just because uh, the compiler basically applies this name mangling. And that means we cannot easily identify calls to these libraries anymore. But um, fortunately, at the time already, there were some library detection mechanisms also implemented by us and others that allowed us to um, re-identify these libraries. So I won't go into details here. Many of these approaches work using machine learning and, and some feature correlation. Um, but let's assume as a black box approach, this works and we are able to re-identify libraries. Um, then we implemented some key extraction using Harvester, right? So Harvester would tell us for these API calls what keys are actually um, you know, dynamically being computed here. And then we also used um, Harvester to extract some table names, right? So what tables are actually being um, 
accessed by these apps. And the rest we would then actually be able to do in a second um, step manually. So we basically implemented our own little exploitation tool that would just take these keys, keys extracted from the app and use the table names extracted from the app. And then using this, we would be able to um, very easily generate an exploit. So basically we would have um, you know, some engine that then uses the key to actually access the backend as a service to then extract some concrete database information. And um, it's a bit of an ethical dilemma here, right? So we are actually uh, accessing real world user information from real world servers. Um, so we got this cleared by the ethics board back then, but only because we said uh, we would not really look at the data, we would also not publish it. Um, and uh, this is also legally okay in, in Germany if you only do this for research to show that it works. Um, obviously, if you do anything else with that data, um, that's actually forbidden. So if you do any such study, make sure to actually clear it um, with the ethics board. Um, yeah, just to, to give you some more concrete information here, right? So some of this information might look like this, right? So this, these might be some keys extracted and these might be some database information uh, that we extracted. And then we would directly use the backend as a service API and call it directly to actually get this information out of the um, backends as a service. And uh, yeah, we really had some disturbing findings, I have to say. Um, so um, I will uh, talk a little bit more about this um, in the next video.